we would now like to call to order the uh, Columbus City Council meeting for February 27th, 2019. And we'll all stand, please, and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So everyone, please look at letter B, the consent agenda. Would you please cross out number three, which is the approval of the January 19th minutes. And notice the addition of number four, the approval of the 1010 and the 1114 city council meetings. And I would like a motion, please, to pass the agenda. I'll make a motion to pass the consensus agenda with him. Change it, we put forward. Second. <clears throat> All those in favor? Can we have discussion? Uh, oops. Sure, discussion, sorry. I would propose on C if we could move the discussion up ahead of the two motions on the Planning Commission report so we could talk about that ahead of the recommendation. I have no problem. Do we have to vote on that or just? Uh, you should, uh, yes, you should amend the agenda by a vote of the council. So that would be a motion in the form of a motion. Mm -hmm. Does everyone understand what she's asking no. for? I'm just suggesting moving the discussion up ahead of the two motions by the Planning Commission so we could okay. talk about that in advance. Okay. Anyone else have anything to add? Then would someone like to make a motion that we, a motion in a second, that we change the order? I move that we change the order. I second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? All right, then we'll consider that moved up. So then at this time we'll go to letter C, and I guess we'll begin Mr. with... Mayor, oop. there's a motion on the floor for the consent oh. agenda. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. All right, all those in favor of the consent agenda with the addition? Yeah. Any more discussion? We've already discussed. Call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. But that's what confused me. We had one on the table and we changed another one. So, so now we're all we're, all we're good? Because we didn't. We're good. All right. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> we're all so whipped up about our new high V that we can't focus. <laughs> so anyway, so now what we'll do is go to letter C, number eight, but we're going to take the discussion and proposed worksheet to residential zone district. Pages 26 to 31. Shall I have the Planning Commission representative come up for that discussion? Yes. Yes. All right. Ron, would you please come up? And we're on pages 26 and 31. <laughs> Certainly, if she'll behave. I'll try. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Good evening. Others. Do you want uh, me to start off? We're going to do the discussion. No, well, well, let's talk about the discussion. <coughs> the discussion of the residential worksheet workshop. Mm -hmm. The proposed worksheet residential zone businesses. As you know, at the last meeting, we had two IUP applications. And in the ordinance, I believe I'm correct, but if I'm not, when you ask for an IUP, in the ordinance it says for a period of one to five years. So we would like to, some board members would like to discuss with you guys, with everyone. There's been some proposals that when someone comes for their initial IUP, instead of granting a five-year interim use permit right off the bat, that either we could grant a one-year or a two-year or a three-year or a five-year, whatever. And the reason that was discussed for that is when someone in Columbus is issued an interim use permit, that's a privilege. They're opening a small business of type. 
of some type in a residential area. It's a privilege for them to do it. If we didn't have the IUP procedure, they would have to go rent a building somewhere or buy other property or something. This gives these people with an idea a chance to start something small. But I, I think in my mind, the bottom line is they can do it if it's invisible to their neighbors. I think that's some interpretation we'll get. So if you start a quilting business in the back room, that's invisible. If you bring in three bobcats and a snowblower and a you know, stepladder and all of this, that's, it can be invisible. If you agree, understand, and are willing to put it where it's supposed to be, you know, out of sight, stored in buildings, stored behind a berm, stored whatever, and that's all laid out in our ordinances. But if by going down instead of an automatic five year, if we say you can have a one year or a year and a half to come in, get your application, get your business started, have time to, for the applicant to see that it's working or if there has to be some changes or for the neighbors, he comes in and dumps a dump truck load of junk in the yard and all the neighbors are smelling it and he's working at five in the morning till 10 at night. Then instead of having to put up with it for five years at the one year, two year mark or three year mark, he comes back in for his a reapplication and it can be discussed with the staff and the attorney and the police or whoever needs to be discussed with. And you can, it helps hold, it helps staff hold these people a little bit more accountable was some of the discussion. So would anyone like to join in on the discussion? I think I've, that's my take of it. Anybody else want to add or subtract or whatever? I'd be willing to. I, so I just put together a little proposal. One of the things that I was um, uh, working on with staff was to develop uh, a more comprehensive IUP application that would ask for more specific information. And as I was working on that, it made me think that it made sense to have the first application um, or the first uh, time period for the application be one year, one year from the time that it would be approved. And then the applicant would come back the second year and with that submit another application. And the purpose for that would be that it would um, allow for that applicant to prove themselves that they truly can operate invisibly and that they aren't you know, creating a negative impact to their neighbor. It also, I think, helps that they would be in business for a year and perhaps some things that they hadn't thought about in that first year application would then become apparent to them and they could include that in the second year and that would be more information for the city to consider. Um, you know, the downside of that is that it means coming back in a year. It means paying the application fee twice. Um, and, you know, it's more work for the staff to process two applications. But I also think it gives the city the upper hand in case you do have a applicant that's non-compliant or where they're, they're impacting the neighbors in a negative way. So um, I just thought it was worth raising that as a um, consideration. And I'm interested to hear what others think about that. Great council, what do we think? Any opinions? I think, it's, I think it's a good idea. I think a year might be too short, uh, maybe 18 months, two years maybe. And I'd like to see application fees. What are they now for application? $200. 200, that's it. And then they have to um, give an escrow of $1,500 for expenses incurred for the consultants to draft reports or answer any questions associated um, with the residential zone business. Would they need that fee the second time if it was a year and a half, two years out? Would they need that $2,000 or whatever that was? Uh, planner's report would still have to be drafted once again um, for, and, it, and it's a new application process, so we would still go through the public hearing process and we would still have a planner's report based on the submittal that was submitted to the city, so um, if there was any changes or any changes to their business, they would have a new narrative or a new site plan if things had changed and that would have to be reviewed again. You would think with all the complaints on that project, they'd be 
it was more streamlined, be easier to, to do the second time? You wouldn't think you'd need all that? Um, Elizabeth, uh, please clarify. So whatever is not used of the $1,500, what it is returned to the applicant, right? Correct. I mean, so it's, it's an escrow. So we, we take it for associated ex expenses related to that particular application. So depending on what consultant we use or what issue came up, because I can never tell what's going to come up because when you have a public hearing, neighbors will come in and they'll, they'll say different things. So there might be a legal question. There might be an engineering question. There might be a planning question. So it's really whatever... Um, associated bills that we get from consultants that we use against that escrow. So say we only have $600 worth of bill, then they'll, they'll get the other um, $900 back um, in a refund within six months to a year. I was hoping that this first year would be more like a probationary period and not necessarily a whole new full Monty. <laughs> well, well, an interim use permit is given for a, a certain term, so and that term expires. So there isn't what I would call a renewal process. It actually terminates. So if you, if you issue a permit for one year, it terminates, and the idea is that they apply again. So it's not a renewal. It's, that's not the, that would be a license and other types of forms that actually renew. This terminates. So you actually get a new one you know, a new interim use permit with a new sunset date. So it just, it op that's the way it operates, which is why you need a brand new permit to be submitted. Mm -hmm. And it's given to a business or a person, not the land. This is a permit that does not run with the land. So if they move, it automatically terminates. But I think the intent is similar to what you just said, is that that first year or year and a half, whatever the, the term ends up being, would be um, a, a, a time period that they would basically prove that they could be compliant with the conditions of the IUP and operate invisibly. And I think, um, you know, I think the if the initial application doesn't change significantly the second time around, then I would assume most of that escrow would be returned back and it would be essentially the $200 fee which probably covers your time and the cost of posting the public hearing and those sorts of things so that's probably I would guess pretty much eating up most of that $200 I don't know how much you could reduce that the second year the 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 $200 doesn't really come close to postage the time the the um, public hearing minutes I mean mm. all of the things that we incur as staff the um, $1,500 is strictly for consultant time mm -hmm. so yeah we're there's really not a whole lot of margin if any in the $200 mm. you're above and beyond the, <laughs> the 200 just by doing the publishing and the paperwork that goes with it and I would like to also say board members so this is the first as soon as we get to it, the first two IUPs of the new board. And that's why we moved it up to the top so we could come to some kind of consensus and, and move forward from that point and not do somebody else and then change it and then have somebody say, well, you've already set precedent or whatever. Mm -hmm. So keep talking to what? Je uh, Jesse? Yep. I'd like to see it uh, two years to the one year. Is one year is to you don't know if the business is going to survive. Two years, you've got a chance of making it work. In two years, it's easy to, you know, in two years, we, you should know if any complaints or anything that they could not be renewed. Anybody else have any number in mind? I have a comment, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, so this is, this would become um, a practice, not a code matter. So you could grant up to five years. Essentially, you're giving, um, with this statement, you're giving folks notice that um, the, the council, as a practice, may limit you to two years. Um, that doesn't prevent you from granting five for uh, exceptional circumstances. It doesn't stop you from granting less. 
I, I do think it, it would be good practice, even if you decide to limit tonight's IUPs to two years, that you get some feedback from Planning Commission as well, because most planning matters, um, council refers to Planning Commission for some discussion. Mm -hmm. Do the whole council, the next planning commission meeting, or just right? I'm not saying that you can't limit it to two years tonight. That's that's mm -hmm. always your prerogative because the code says up to five years. So you can limit it tonight, uh, but I think as a as a practice, uh, even tonight and going forward, that if you have changes um, to how you process interim use permits, it's good to get uh, feedback from the planning commission. Thank you, planning commissioners. What do you think? We would like some feedback. I guess the senior member will start. <laughs> um, I think it's a good idea because we do get a lot of complaints and we get them after the fact. Um, it is a privilege and it does need to be um, under wraps. I uh, have a relative, I'll just relay a, on a personal note, living in my neighborhood, I, I think I might have a little bit of a excavation trucks on my block now, you know, I've been watching them for a couple of days, but if they're, you know, all of a sudden trucks are parked and that's going to become apparent real quick. So, I mean, I, I think it's something to really look at. Um, I do have a question for Bill, if that's okay. Are we able to, um, you know, nobody wants to pay twice if you're compliant, you're following all the rules. Is there ever a, um, if they come back in in a year, uh, like a tier system of payment? You know, instead of having to go through the whole, I know you said there's a sunset date, but um, like they come back in, they're perfect. Is there a, a, a different process we could put them through? You know, they don't, that they don't have to go through all the paperwork or legally do we have to start from the beginning? Mr. Mayor, Council, the, legally we'd have to treat it as a new application. Um, the, the alternative would be to change the code to provide for a probationary period of two years and that if there are no complaints or problems, that that could be extended, but that would be a code change. So if you're gonna to act tonight um, to establish a two-year initial term, um, that can be done without a code amendment, but what you've described, uh, Pam, is, is something that would take a, a code amendment. Thank you. Hmm? I have just one question. Would that mean that you'd have to have another public hearing every Yes, you correct. Know, you'd, so you'd have more public hearings. Correct. Okay. May we have an opinion, Councillor? What yes. Is, is it better off to do the wait and do the change, or just put a two-year term on it, or three or whatever is chosen? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, I'm not uncomfortable with the council deciding tonight to put a two-year term on an interim use permit because the code is written in such a way that it allows you to do that. Okay. Um, I think you could have a fuller discussion of how you look at alternatives maybe after tonight or maybe after the first round of uh, permits go through. In other words, do you want to uh, adopt a probationary concept? Do you want to have a, a tier structure? The easiest thing for you to do is to set a, uh, a term tonight. Rationale has been given. I think it's important for the minutes to contain that rationale as, as you adopt the motion so that it's clear why you're you're going from a five year to a two year, um, but I but I am comfortable that you can do that and it's in your authority to do that tonight. Thank you. All right, council. Then we've established that we can do it. We've established. I think everybody would is not against doing it. So then it's just the term. How long? How long should we do it? Five years we think is too long. One year is not very long because by the time you apply, get all the paperwork done, two or three months have gone by, correct? So then actually his first year, a one-year deal is actually only nine months of being in business. It is, it is true. I, I'm just thinking of, of process. Usually that's what goes through my mind is, and I realize that we're, we're looking at an initial application, but we're not looking at subsequent applications. So I don't think whether your guidance, I don't want, I don't think you should limit yourself because the first time, if you gave them two years, then they come in two years later, you still want the ability to give them five years mm -hmm. if there was no issue. So, right. so I do think that, you know, whether, whether it's tiered, I do think you have to articulate because I want to be able to tell people up front before they, they get before you because I don't want any, them to figure out there's any surprises. So I think whatever we decide as a group, 
um, as far as one year or two years for your initial, that we get that out into the checklist or somewhere else so that they're put on notice. And then subsequent permits, if there's no issue, you would be willing to give longer terms. That's correct. Um, can you can you clarify, can you do one year from the date of approval or does it have to be from the date of the application? I think we've always done approval. Right, it's from approval and I think the, the reference to it would be you'd be reapplying before that permit is up in order to right. get the renewal. Oh, I see. So yeah. that's where you get. So within nine, nine months, you're probably thinking about a reapplication, so you don't lose that. Okay. Which is maybe why the the two year would be a little more flexible than than mm -hmm. a one year. And less painful financially. Mm -hmm. I mean, they get an extra six eight months before they have to start the paperwork process. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, can I interject a statement here? <laughs> there's two things. There's new business and there's non-complying. So uh, there's people who are running businesses quietly and some not quietly in Columbus. So sometimes we see applications after, after, the, fact. after the fact. So I kind of think we need to leave ourselves some room of why are they here? Are they new? Is it without, you know, mm -hmm. after the fact kind of too? Because we get into that water where I think it's important that we know what, what all the facts. Do you follow me? I understand what you're saying, but what are you suggesting be done? So they, because the issues are complaint driven in Columbus. Some of them. Or, yeah, some people just come in and apply. Some people are doing whatever they're doing, and then the neighbors. Right. Well, I guess what I'm saying is, if we set a precedent of two years, and we, and we already know that we have uh, application and we have complaints, and we're, they're coming into compliance, yay! So maybe two years is too long if we already have. So I, I'm just kind of, I just want to throw that in there as I don't mean to throw a curveball, but it's something we should consider. Mr. Mayor and Council, I think the reason the code is written up to five years is so you can take into account those facts when someone's coming in. Are they coming in to essentially legalize a business that's been there, mm -hmm. or are they coming in ahead of time to get a, a business legally approved before it started? So that's why, at least in my view, the code gives you that latitude for you know any amount of time mm -hmm. up to five years. Um, so I think you can, I think you can uh, undertake the direction. If it's consensus of the council, you can adopt a motion tonight that would establish a practice going forward, including the applications if you decide tonight um, that are on the agenda um, that would uh, establish a two-year initial term. Um, and then uh, you know, they're obviously free to, to reapply for a five-year after that. Thank you. So everyone, do we think one year, two years, three years? Denny, you say two. I say two. Janet? I would be okay. I mean, I, I guess I prefer one, but I'm, I'm open to two. Really? Two would be fine with me. Two years. Two is good. I, I want one, one question answered. This $1,500 in escrow, does everybody usually pay part of that? In other words, there's always something that has yes. to be. There's, there's always a plenary part to, um, drafted for each application, so there's always costs associated to any application that comes in. Otherwise, the city would be paying for the cost. I guess my, my thing is, is that, okay, we do it for two years, I, and I think it's fine, the $200, I understand, but I think, you know, 1500 over again, you know, is onerous, can it be rolled over, or how do they get it back so that they can give you fifteen more hundred dollars you know uh, for their five year so are you saying that so someone comes in they pay the two hundred dollars that covers city costs and city staff then you have a consultant that's going to draft a planner's report so either the business owner pays for it because he's asking for the permit or you take it out of the general fund and all the citizens of Columbus pay No for I it. think that they should pay out of the fifteen hundred what I'm saying is that they paid the fifteen hundred at at the two-year um, application, and they come back and they're gonna get a five-year, okay, so then do they get that refunded or is it rolled over? Any, 
anything that they have not had to have spent on their. So it's issue. refunded. It's re so when they apply the first time, the money is as soon as we get all the bills from the consultant, then we, we issue a refund check. So in two years when they apply again, then they would come in again, pay the $200. So we don't, we don't keep a running tally on anyone. So money that's um, not spent is, is returned. That satisfy your answer? Sure, question. So would anyone like to make a motion? I would move that we adopt a practice, is that the correct term, practice, to limit first application of an IUP to two years with the option for them to come back after two years um, and apply for a longer period of time. Second. And discussion. You want to say limit it to two years or because of the discussion of the one year, if you really wanted to do just a one year for something special. So not more than? Not more than. Not more that's than. Yeah, that's what I meant by limit. Okay. Yes, not more and than else, two years. Anything more to add to this great discussion? Then let's call for a vote. Or do we have a second? I did. Okay, mm -hmm. yep, call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <laughs> All right, it passes. So now we're back to the Planning Commission members. If you haven't fallen asleep, mm -hmm. and we'll take uh, number 8A, <coughs> a motion of the or of an IUP residential zone district for Daniel Wallock III at 16915 Potomac Street. Pages for us 4 to 11. Okay. Yeah, introduce yourself to everybody. Oh. <laughs> uh, my name is Ron Hanegraaff, and I'm on the Planning Commission, <clears throat> the chairman. And um, last Wednesday, February 20th, at, uh, 2019, uh, we had an open uh, public hearing on uh, Waldock Lawn and Snow Incorporated. Uh, the business was represented by the owner, Dan Waldock. Uh, Dan explained his business that um, he had five bobcats, a bobcat trailer, three lawnmowers, two trailers, and two trucks that he was storing on the property. It should be known that uh, it's my understanding that he has only lived at this property for a, a short period of time. So I don't think he's been running a business there for years. I, th I think it just kind of happened or whatever. His hours uh, for his landscaping, would, in the summer hours, would be 7 a.m. to either 4, 5, 6, or 7 p.m. at the latest. And that's just to get the equipment back in on the property. Uh, winter hours is uh, on call. In other words, like we had a snowstorm at 2 o'clock in the morning, they're out the door. So that's that should be noted that the bobcats are on site in Minneapolis. They're not in his uh, bull barn on Potomac during this period of time. So uh, we talked about uh, bringing home stuff, items, some of his landscaping, like uh, leaves and stuff like that. He does bring leaves home, and he puts them in a compost pile behind his house, which is not seen by the public. Uh, when we opened up to the public hearing, we had his neighbor, Mr. John Williams, step up, the only person that talked that night, and he had nothing but good things to say about his neighbor. And I come down to believe that if there was an issue, he'd walk over there and tell him. I don't think he'd be coming up to the city to complain. He talked about his business growing in the future, and if it did grow in the future, that uh, he would, uh, he has enough land to build another building in the back. We did discuss and tell him that it's supposed to be an invisible business and all the uh, equipment had to be stored inside. Now, he, we had a little question on the size of the building because his, uh, whoever drew up the plans came up with a building that was a little different than what he put down, but it's 38 by 32 on the... Uh, scaled, uh, whatever it is there, drawings he's got here. Anyway, I asked him, or it was asked of him, if he could store that amount of equipment inside there, and he said he would get it in there. 
At first, he started talking about half the building, but now it's the whole building when we get down to the end of the... Uh, I do it. Okay. Um, we also brought up the deal about uh, if he read the TKDA uh, findings of facts and the recommendations, and uh, he read them here, which... Maybe we should talk about that, Elizabeth. Are they supposed to get this on email or? Yes. Okay, if I'm right, he didn't get it, did he? Or? He did. He did? He just didn't read it. Oh, okay. Well, he read it here at, at the thing. And he had uh, no issues on any of the items, of the 13 items of findings of facts or the nine recommendations by TKDA. Uh, after we closed the hearing, um, we had a discussion and uh, we took a vote, and the uh, Planning Commission voted unanimously to recommend or approve approval of the IUP and send it back to you. At that time, I think we were talking five years. That was mentioned. So I don't know where you stand now with it. In your additions on A2 um, of your agenda packet, um, you'll find the recommendations of the Planning Commission. The underlined the underlined in the conditions are edits that I made to the conditions as a result of the discussion of by the Planning Commission. And Mr. Mayor and Council, just one quick typo. Um, condition number eight says that the IEP may be revoked by the city upon property notice and public hearing. It should be proper notice. Just a small change um, that will get reflected in the minutes. In item number one, it talks about the term. So it states that the term of the IUP shall, shall be five years from the date of issuance. And I believe um, the chairman of the planning commission, is that's what he's referring to as their recommendation was for five years. So that was their recommendation, but we have decided we'll start with a two. So we simply cross out the five and put a two. That's correct. Based on your prior action, that would become two rather than five. Anyone see anything else of a concern? Are we going to make sure he can get all of that equipment into his pole barn? Because that sounded like that was a big question mark. I mean, can not that be a contingency? During our discussion, I explained to Dan that he needed to put all of the equipment inside the building, and I think during the public hearing, he, he did recite that, yes, I remember Elizabeth telling me that I needed to put all my equipment in. But as he explained that he had, I believe it was two trailers at the side of the building, and then he did have another site that he was storing some of his equipment in. But I think that in this case, the conditions spe specifically say that he must keep his okay. equipment inside the building. And in this case, um, he identified the 32 by 38 as the building that he was going to store the equipment in. He did not identify the existing 24 by 24 garage. So, and, and that's one of the things I think that in our new checklist, I, it would be, it would be, it would be good for someone who's doing a compliance inspection to know exactly what buildings he's going to store things in. So in, in condition number six, I put all equipment and activities associated with the business shall be kept inside. And then I just put a note here, the 38 or the 32 by 38 accessory building identified on the site plan. Because during the hearing, that is the building he identified he was going to put his equipment in. Mm -hmm. He did identify that he was going to have a compost site in the backyard and realistically, you wouldn't be able to put a compost site in, inside the building. He indicated that it would be screened by the neighbors and it would just be leaves. Mm -hmm. I think he said that compost site was for his personal use, though, for his garden. So it wasn't a business, kind of. He's just bringing it home. Excuse me, Elizabeth, should that have been addressed then a little more tightly? 
but of course it's it's for his own garden if he has 10,000 acres of corn but remember we had all the all of the uh, issues on Lake Drive when somebody did a big compost thing that could have been you know the size of it perhaps or so the neighbor starts getting a whiff in August of three dump truck loads of grass clippings and all of that and uh, and I agree the the complaints that we received there w were odor um, driven and and when you compost, if you have many leaves, we didn't really talk about how much leaves, whether they were, he was um, putting them in rows, whether they were gonna be heated, you know, cause those leaf piles become very hot and that's the whole point of how they decompose. But if you, um, if they're in plastic bags and they're they're not turned, they, they definitely have an odor and we did have a problem on Lake Drive with compost piles because it almost smells like ammonia and, um, and so I was thinking the same thing, but if, if, if we think it's a more of on a personal use that he brings them home and he uses them in his own garden, that's on a very small scale versus the, the lake drive operation was huge. I mean, there were rows and the, the rows were very tall and they had to turn them weekly in order to compost them. And they had to monitor the heat of the piles because it was uh, apparently they can get quite warm. Mr. Mayor and Council, I think the conditions address that. So all activities, all equipment and activities associated with the business shall be kept in the 38 by 32 accessory building. So in other words, he wouldn't be able to compost in connection with the business because that wouldn't be located right. within mm -hmm. the building. So it would have to be personal use. Mm -hmm. He did talk about turning it over at all, as you said. Yeah. yeah. That he'd go out with a bobcat and keep turning it. Anyone else have anything different? If not, I'll ask for a vote. Mr. Mayor, we need a motion. do you mind if I recap the changes nope. uh, for the record to make sure that we've got them? Um, so on page A2, uh, under the conditions, the term of the IEP shall be two years from the date of issuance. Uh, number six, we're adding 38 by 32 accessory building as identified on the site plan. And in number eight, we're just... Uh, correcting the word property to read proper notice in public hearing. I will also add, Mr. Mayor, that number 10 is one that I added. Um, it said the city will conduct a compliance inspection annual, annually after issuance date. If you feel that the two-year term will accommodate any issues with compliance, then we can certainly do that and eliminate it. This, I felt that... Uh, Indicating and putting them on notice that we were going to annually um, inspect, we felt that that would motivate them to keep their business-related equipment and activities inside the building. I am not against keeping the compliance check if they can do it properly. This applicant or anyone else for one year, another year, then they showed that they're willing to do what, is, what we ask. Anybody else have a problem with that? All right. So then, shall we take a vote? No, oh, make a motion. Okay, make a motion. Make a motion to accept the CUP, or IUP, I mean, uh, for uh, two years and, and uh, recommendations and change the uh, property to. What were we changing it to? Proper. 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 Mm -hmm. There's one other thing, wasn't there? Size of the pole building? 38 by 32, that's in condition six. Okay. Do we have a second for that? Second. Any more discussion, anyone? If not, we'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? So then this passes with a two-year term instead of a five-year. And would you like to, uh, do you have to read the, I'm sorry. Go ahead for the next one for Michelle Whitney, please. Okay, our second uh, public hearing was Michelle Whitney on the business called Happy Trails Grooming. And that was at 7640 Crossways Lake Drive. 
Uh, Michelle Whitney was uh, present and represented the, the business, even though, well, I have to go back to Elizabeth on this, the business is not in her name. So did that get straightened out? So it, I, I have talked with the applicant and it has been indicated to me that the business name has, um, the business was put in her name and she has refiled the paperwork. So she will be the owner of the business and the um, owner and occupant of the home. That's her niece? No. Her niece will also oh. live there, but Michelle uh, Whitney has applied for the business in her name and she will also be living in the house. That was my mistake there. Okay, well, anyway, the, the Michelle Whitney uh, approached uh, the Planning Commission and explained the uh, operation that's going to be operated out of the house. I don't believe that there's, this is an ongoing business. This is a startup, and I don't know if it's a legal term or not, but it's kind of like a ma and pa deal. It's a dog grooming uh, business, and the operation would be 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and the location of it is inside the attached garage. There's a 12 by 12 uh, room in there that's uh, insulated, heated with water, and that's where the dogs would get groomed. Um, the dogs will never leave the area and uh, only be outside when the owners are leaving or come arriving. Uh, the issue in the beginning was Michelle Whitney has a niece named Stephanie Collar who lives at the residence and owns, was the owner's name on the, the business called Happy Trails Grooming. Uh, Michelle was in the same kind of principal business in Centerville and retired and she just liked to groom a few dogs during the week and maybe one to six clients a week, Monday through uh, Saturday, nine to five. These are only phone appointments. This is not an advertisement, though she wants a sign on the side of her garage facing crossways that would just distinguish that this is the location for Happy Trails Grooming. She did not talk about advertising like in the paper as a grooming business. Uh, Michelle is looking at doing uh, this for about two or three years. And... Uh, the way it sounds is that her niece is going to take the business into Forest Lake and open up a shop there. So it doesn't look like this is going to be a long-term business run out of the home. Uh, Ms. Whitney was given uh, a copy of the TKDA uh, report concerning the 14 items of findings of facts and 11 recommendations by TKDA, and she had no issues regarding the findings or the recommendations. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's going to be a, a real neighborhood disturbance place because if you go to the location, the traffic is louder than any dog could bark down there. So I don't think that'll be an issue. And as far as getting uh, refuge from the dogs, it'll all go in the garbage, whatever they have. Uh, the Planning Commission voted uh, uh, unanimously, unanimously to recommend an approval of the IUP and send it back to you. Council. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anyone have any issues that weren't discussed? I don't. I have a question nope. in signage. Um, we talk about the being on the the structure, and you know we have a five acre limit here, and a lot of the homes are not right on the road. And I know that she has in the past had a, a very unobtrusive sign. Um, closer to the road, not on, on um, the main drag there, but on crossways. And I was wondering why we, we insist that she have a sign that can't be seen. You know, the code calls for the sign to be on the building that the business is located in, and it doesn't, it doesn't call for any other signage because of the idea that it was being invisible so that you wouldn't have a business sign in a residential district. So in this case, um, it would need a code change to place it anywhere else. This is a one by two sign, it's a very small sign. Right. That's allowed today. Right, but I mean, you know, the, the one, I don't know that her sign out by the road was any bigger than the one by two, you know, it was just okay. a very small. It's almost like a directional thing. You know, we were all very spaced out there and everything, so I just, I was just questioning that, and if it has to take a, you know, a change to the code, then okay. 
you know, we can, what we can start to do is there's, we do housekeeping for code changes, you know, on, an, on a yearly basis. And so these smaller ones that we think that if there's consensus and you want to do, we'll just put in a house, more of a housekeeping one that's, you know, it's, it's, it's good to do. It's good practice. You're okay with it. It's, it's good policy. And we can certainly do that rather than doing a whole code amendment process for something small like that. But we can certainly do that and keep notes if, if everyone agrees. Anyone else have anything to add? I, I love the details on the drawings that she put forth. It was real, real nice. If not, how about a motion from someone in a second, please? Who wants to make a motion? Billy, Ken? I'll make a motion that we accept the plan, planning commission's recommendation in past. Mr. Mayor and Council, then the uh, term would be again two years, mm -hmm. and we'll catch the same uh, typo in condition 10 instead of property notice, proper notice. So moved. Second. Any more discussion? Anyone? If not, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? If not, it passes. Anything else to comment on from your meeting last Wednesday? No, but I think it's good that you get a two-year deal, you know. It's kind of nice to have something to go back on people. So if somebody has got a five-year one now, they come in and it's just automatic five years? Yeah, they would come back to the to Elizabeth and she'd set, set up a hearing. I think, the, I think the Planning Commission and Council has still has the discretion of up to five years. Mm -hmm. So yes, it wouldn't it wouldn't be automatically five years. It would they would still have the discretion to say anything up to five. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, Council. At this time, we're finally down at number nine, and it's public open forum. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to come up and address the board? And seeing no one, we'll move on to letter D. Is the uh, Stoneville Club, are they here for something on the agenda? They're on the agenda. Yep. Okay. And they're down at, uh, attorney under the attorney report. So, engineer report number 10. Uh, yes, I have a couple items on the uh, report this evening. The first one is the Hornsby Street feasibility study. Mm -hmm. And we discussed this at the council work session, but this is um, the idea of improving Hornsby Street south of 97 down to um, 145th. It's about a mile section of roadway and bringing that road into a 10 ton uh, type roadway. The feasibility report has three options that we went over. Um, the existing roadway is 11 or 12 foot lanes with one foot or so gravel shoulders. Um, we came up with three different options. Option A would be to put back 12 foot lanes with four foot gravel shoulders. Option B would put, um, all options have 12 foot travel lanes. Option B would also have four foot paved shoulders with four foot gravel shoulders. And option C would have eight foot paved shoulders with four foot gravel shoulders, which is what Hornsby Street south of 97 was, that section was previously improved to. Um, in real round numbers, the cost of those three options we are estimating at 1.5 million, 2.2 million, and 2.9 million, um, respectively for the three different options. Um, we also have a tentative very tentative schedule that if option B or C is the council's choice, if this goes forward, we would likely be looking at 2020 construction due to um, possible, there be, might be some possible uh, wetland impacts in a couple locations with widening the roadway. So at this time, we're looking for you to accept the report and um, because I'm not asking at this time, you know, to authorize Preparation of plans and specs. I think there's some financial discussions that you had wanted to have yet, but this would just be to accept the report as is, or if you have any comments, any changes you'd like to make to it. I have a question, Dennis, please. So you say would, wouldn't it be this coming season, 2019, it would be mm -hmm. start? It would be designed this summer, fall, and then bid over next winter and constructed summer 2020. Okay. 
and also you mentioned the wetland impacts that everyone in Columbus is so aware of. Is it a, a large amount or a small amount? Or it's large? not a large amount. There's an area where there's some wetlands on the east side that come up to the roadway, and then maybe some of the ditch areas um, as well. And that has to be mitigated for, or is there any kind of program for safety? Most likely it would have to be mitigated for, mm -hmm. okay. um, most typically. But a small amount, a quarter acre, half acre? Yeah, we haven't come up with an acreage, but it's, it's, obvious, it's definitely not you know, the majority length. It's, it's probably in that quarter acre range if I had to throw out a number right now. It, but. And that's not included in the, the dollar figures? That's part of the overall cost. It is part of it. Yeah. Okay. But the wetlands mitigation isn't part of the option A, is that correct? Right. With option A, the, one, the road's not being widened that much to where we would not have impacts to the wetlands or very minimal. Mr. Mayor, I know that there was a question earlier on Section 6 on the financial financing of the improvements. And I know during the workshop we talked about coming back with some um, options on what financing would um, be possible and what implications that would be if we did general obligation bonds as far as payment plans. And then having the option to look at more of a hybrid type of funding schedule. In other words, we would maybe take some from um, the maintenance fund, maybe some from um, the TIF funding that we have opportunity for on a very small scale. And in this particular case, under the financial um, improvement section, it indicates that it's proposed that the project are constructed with general funds and that special assessments to adjacent properties are not proposed. And I think the um, council would feel um, they feel that maybe we should have still some of all of the opportunities on the table. I'm not sure of, of the language that we could um, put in there. In other words, so that we would say we would look at a hybrid, that maybe there is a component of special assessments or developer fees or some sort of um, opportunity to use multiple, multiple, fu multiple funding sources. And I'm not sure of the language, but maybe you have some possible language to include there. Yeah, if it's your desire to incorporate that, we can come back with some um, language that would lead more options. Just so we don't exclude it, whatever it would turn out to be. But do we have to insert this now or accept it and then? Um, I'm not sure if you would accept it administratively or? I, I think you can accept it with that, that concept, um, knowing that it'll come back as it refined. Um, it essentially would give, I mean, we could do that right now, but it's uh, essentially saying that you would look at a, a variety of funding sources, including general funds, special assessments, developer fees, and tax increment funds. So I think that would that would cover the range of options. We just add that in? Right I think now? you could add that in and, and accept it with that. Could you repeat that? Sure. It is proposed that the project be constructed with general funds, period, the city would also look at alternatives that would include special assessments, comma, developer fees, comma, tax increment financing, and- um, City maintenance funds. And city maintenance funds. <clears throat> It'll save you some paper, bring it back. And the city maintenance funds I'm referring to is the, the capital improvement plan that we put away for money for blacktop. Would this be a good topic, like another topic for a uh, little workshop? Once you come back with these numbers, sure. You know, spend an hour going through it, revisit why why it should be done, or if it should be done, why it should be done, when it should have been done. It's a forty-year-old project that got kicked down the road, but also it's a lot of money. It's a lot of work. I would like everybody to really feel comfortable, whatever the decision is. But that makes me think maybe a little workshop. Okay. In the future. Dennis, part of that is a 10 ton road now, isn't it? The part we just redid a year or two ago? Up the ago. northerly piece adjacent to 97, yes. How far down is that? It goes about a quarter mile through the city property, 40. The Dan Mike's corner. Yep. Okay. So 
Anyone have anything else? And not. they want this replaced. If not, would someone please make a motion? I'd like to make a motion to accept the feasibility study on Hornsby reconstruction with the additions that uh, Bill put in the records. And is there a second? I'll second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? It passes. Dennis, number two, Ziegler Water Tank. Everyone, pages 52 to 56. Yeah, you should have a uh, memo in your uh, council packet for it. It's combined. It, it's two, I'll call them separate projects, but yet they're related, so it's all in one. And um, I'll just give you a brief re overview of what we had discussed previously. I also have uh, Matt Ellingson from our office here. And in, uh, in the green shirt there, he's our water systems engineer. If you have any very specific questions about the improvements. Um, the, the first portion is the Ziegler water tank, and I'll call it phase two. We've done some work to it already, the, the uh, mechanical work, if you will, and the re realignment of the water main. And this second phase would finish the electrical um, improvements and some tank modifications that remain. And that's the first number um, you see in the memo with the uh, one quote that was received uh, for $65,200. And the second piece of the project is more of the system-wide SCADA um, improvements that would allow you know, all the, the different existing uh, components of the water system to, uh, to function um, together and we had uh, two quotes for that one. You can see they were um, they're fairly close and in control. Uh, Inc. had the slightly lower bid, and they've done a lot of the work in the city, so uh, staff is familiar with them. Um, so what we're recommending is that you can take these in two separate motions to approve these quotes that were received, um, one for the Ziegler water tank phase two and one for the SCADA improvements. And on the top of the second page is kind of a summary of the financial implications, the overall cost of the project for the construction and engineering. We're estimating to be around $174,000. Um, the city has $136,000 in their HRA A balance. Um, so the remainder would be funded out of uh, connection charges. Um, there's a history here of the project, but if you have any questions, let me or, or Matt know. Does anyone have any questions for our engineer? But we need to make two separate motions? Yes, that's we have it laid out. The first motion would be to award the Ziegler water tank conversion phase two um, electrical improvements to EMI. So moved. EIM for, um, I'm sorry, for $65,200. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Any more discussion? Anyone? If not, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? That passes. <clears throat> and the second motion would be to award the SCADA system improvements to in control for uh, $79,154. So moved again. Second? Second. And it's seconded. Uh, any more discussion, anyone? And if not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone Aye. opposed? And it passes. Anything else for us? We would anticipate these improvements occurring in April and May timeframe, and by the end of May. It and quit snowing. Yeah, so they you, can be done. So that would be finished. Right. All done by... End of May. End of May. Well, that's finally, that's good. That's all I had. Thank you. And then next up, we will have our number 11, the attorney report with two items. One is the discussion of the lighting ordinance interpretation, and then also uh, the Race Creek Trail Association request for a permanent trail alignment. Okay. Mr. Counselor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, at the last meeting, we were asked to 
render, uh, do some review of the code and render uh, an opinion on the, um, what is essentially the lighting ordinance. Uh, there have been concerns about uh, glare, direct glare, and uh, nuisance light. Um, since the term direct glare wasn't defined in the code, uh, we took a kind of a common understanding, uh, which means harsh, uncomfortably bright light. So, uh, but we also went back and looked at the provisions um, because I kind of did it on the fly <laughs> at the last meeting. So with a little more time, I want to point out that there's really two components to the lighting ordinance. One is that there's a, a nuisance uh, provision, which says that essentially if you have uh, direct glare or li light from private fixtures exceeding one foot candle at the property line, that's considered uh, to be in violation of our code and that would be treated as a nuisance. So um, I, I broke those down as two separate um, standards, uh, but when I reread it, uh, the and follows the or, and so you would read it as light or glare that exceeds one foot candle as measured at the property line. And um, in reviewing this, it made some sense because we've been saying probably since the day we were hired that we need measurable standards. Uh, and so it didn't, doesn't make sense that you would have something that would not be measurable um, at the property line. So glare uh, would be something that would be observable at the property line at what foot candle and therefore measurable. Um, at least that's our, our read of the ordinance. And it makes it easier for enforcement purposes as well. The other point that was made at the meeting is that uh, somehow this would only be applicable if you're installing new lighting. So it, the new lighting provision is a separate provision that says that uh, all newly installed, repaired, or replaced uh, fixtures shall include cutoff luminaires and shall be direct away from residential property and public streets in such a way that residential structures shall be shielded from direct rays of light and so as not to exceed an intensity of illumination greater than, again, one foot candle as me measured at the property line. So both, both of these provisions have the same standard. One foot candle is measured at the property line. One provision, new fixtures, says as you're replacing and repairing those fixtures, you need to have a cutoff type fixture that prevents glare. The other is a nuisance provision that says if you're going to have one foot candle at the property line, either from direct light or from private uh, fixtures, that that could be considered a nuisance and, and could be enforceable. So, so the, the bottom line is the city doesn't have to wait until someone installs a new fixture to deal with nuisance. If there's, a direct, uh, if there's direct glare and it's reaching a level of one foot candle at the property line, which is a pretty high standard, um, then, then we can act on that and we have the enforcement capability to do that. What it would require is a complaint from a property owner and then a measurement of that light um, at the property line, obviously at night, you know, when you can measure that, that uh, light. So I think that's uh, given, given a little more time than just trying to respond on the fly here um, a couple weeks ago. It's a sensible approach. It's consistent with how it's written, and it gives the city uh, enforcement. Uh, we don't have to wait until people install new lighting uh, to deal with enforcement. All right, so, Mr. Councilor, so what you've just said is, if I'm looking at your light, mm -hmm. and it, my eyes are bad and it's glaring, I say, boy, that's glaring. It can be measured mm -hmm. at the property line. Correct. And if it's under one lumen, one lumen. One foot candle. Or one foot candle. Yep. candle maybe, it's, maybe it's irritating me, but it's, that's the ordinance. It's legal. That's the way it is. Correct. We've upset a, we've set it objective standards, and we we try and do this as much as possible in all of our enforcement uh, provisions, all of our code compliance. We try and make it measurable, so it isn't uh, you know whether it's decibel readings for sound or foot candles for lighting. We want to make it an objective standard as much as possible, so that we're not getting into an argument over somebody's subjective view of the light. Has anyone else got any questions or? Discussion on the issue. No, it makes sense. It's measurable from the corner, so it needs something we can put our teeth into and measure, actually. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item is the, uh, the permit for the Rice Creek Trail Association. This is the Snowmobiling Association. Um, we now have a more complete um, 
permit uh, that has been submitted. That's on page 57 of your council packet. I just have two comments. Um, we can wait for the gentleman to come forward. We're starting to get to be uh, regulars, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's because yeah. there's so much snow. It's, yes. Yeah. May we have your name for the... Yeah, I'm Bill Prinson, the president of the Rice Creek Trail Association and Circle Pines. I'm John Bouch. I'm a member of the Rice Creek Trail Association. Thank you. Mr. Mayor and Council, um, the, at the last meeting we discussed a condition that would have the city reviewing the permit following each snowmobiling season. So what I would propose to do, and if the, if, uh, the minutes taker could just uh, follow along on uh, condition number one, um, following the word landowners, we'd insert the city <laughs> shall review the permit following each snowmobiling, snowmobiling season for damage to public or private property, which may require repairs or mitigation. So that would be the ad from the last meeting. Um, in condition number four, um, it says the landowner shall have the right to close said right of way during an emergency, any emergency with the approval of the sponsor. We would strike with the approval of the sponsor. Obviously, if there's an emergency, the public needs to be able to deal with that with or without approval of the sponsor. So we would strike those words. And then the following thing that we would just note is we received a certificate of liability insurance um, which identifies uh, commercial liability. Um, we want, we have a couple comments. These are administrative comments. We'll work with you to resolve those. Uh, we need it in the description of the insurance. We need the city listed as an additional insured and we need uh, full uh, coverage, um, including what was, what were you looking damage. for? Uh, damage, property damage, correct. So those are two items, that, those are comments that we can work with you offline with, through Elizabeth just to get this uh, updated. I thought you already had that. It, it, this, this insurance policy only identifies general liability but no damage, and then it doesn't list us as additionally insured in the endorsement. So I'm, either you have an endorsement or you're in the description. It usually says, you know I mean, the legal description of what the insurance covers. And it, it, there's no description in it. So, what happens then is when you when you go to file a claim, if there's no description, then they then there's some question as to whether it was really covered. We can handle that administratively, can, though. Yeah. Those are changes that your insurer should provide on. Because we've never never had an issue or had a, a situation where it would cover damage to property. It, well, we, we would like it to cover damage to property since you're going over the road. And, who, and who's going to establish what damage is? How, how do you establish damage? So my, understa my understanding is that you were going to put mats down um, right. for the curb yeah. for the sidewalk and that there was specifically that um, if there was, you know what I mean, damage to the, to the sidewalk um, that the, the trail association would be that was the whole idea of the insurance that you would be able to to repair any damage to the sidewalk because we talked about the maps that you were going to put down yeah um so maybe i misunderstood but i thought that's what we that's what we talked about the yeah, last if, yeah we agreed to put maps down mm -hmm. correct yeah so uh, unless there's an objection to those changes to the certificate that can be handled administratively um so i I think we're ready to approve. If the council is comfortable, we're ready to approve the permit as amended. Anyone like to make the motion? I'll make a motion to approve the permit as uh, amended. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Anyone Aye. opposed? Thank you. Okay, could we receive a copy of that? Uh, do you want the, the, the copy of this or after we sign it? After you sign it. Okay. Yep. yep. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. Thank you. We'll see you out in the snow. So the next issues we have going on would be the mayor and city council reports. Jenny, anything to report? Okay, nothing to report. Janet? Um, I'll just report on behalf of the personnel committee that we're still conducting interviews. I think we'll have a couple more next week for the planning commission. So hopefully in the next few weeks we'll be able to come forward to with a recommendation to fill those last two spots. Thank you. Jeff? Nothing. Um, I attended the meetings for the Sunrise River Watershed District and they have made um, 
the decision to increase the funds that are going to be used to track sunfish, or not sunfish, uh, carp in the lakes uh, in Linwood uh, primarily. Um, and then I also attended just now the Fall Fest meeting, and the Fall Fest meeting is humming along, and it sounds like there's going to be some exciting stuff coming up. And uh, they have also set um, definite dates so that more than two of us on the council can be there and, and be part of that uh, festivities planning. And I had one thing. We talked about the technology quarter that we, Elizabeth and I went to. I also had my first meeting and tour with L. Newman, the fire chief of Forest Lake in Columbus. And we looked at all the equipment, and he showed me all his plans. He showed me the new trucks we're going to have to buy, pictures of the new trucks, et cetera, et cetera. And then he said, Elizabeth, he would be getting a hold of you or sending out possible dates for the first board meeting. Yes. Or maybe you have already, but. Not, I have not received any dates uh, yet. Should be coming. So, and that's it for that. Public Works. Thank you for keeping the roads safe and snow free as best you can. Public information, Jessica? Uh, no report, but thank you for taking a look at the lighting ordinance. Yeah. Will that help? Yes. All right. Uh, Elizabeth, City Administrator's Report. I have one, one item under my report, and that is I had a discussion today with Hyla Mays. She is the person that is drafting our comprehensive plan. We went over the, the letter that we received from Met Council, and she's uh, done some work already on the more technical items. And so as we discussed what the next steps were, she's recommending that we meet. And I had her hold the next workshop date, which is April 3rd, because we've already booked the March workshop date as a time for the council to have an opportunity to talk with her through the comprehensive plan changes. And what she identified was the Friday before she would have the draft and all the changes would be in red. And then there would be a policy discussion about the mixed use and where we're going to place the residential component to establish mixed use de uh, designations. And um, the only thing we had questions were, um, was really about the date and then when the discussion would be with the planning commission. So my suggestion is that we take it up on April 3rd from four to six, the council will have an opportunity to talk with Hyla. She'll give a little bit of background because there are some of you who haven't really been through that process. And so she said she would give you a little bit of background, go through the incomplete letter, go through the changes, and then talk about the policy, policy decisions. Take a break after that for like that hour. And then we'll make the, the planning commission also a workshop. And then the planning commission then could have a presentation from Hila and then continue the mixed use designation and other things that we need to clarify in order to resubmit. When I asked her about a time frame, because that was one of the questions I was asked about the incomplete letter, um, while we did not get a specific date from Met Council as to when we should reapply, she did feel that we should, you know, address the issues timely, but not rush it, make sure you're all comfortable with it. But we did commit to the time frame. The deadline was last year. So she said we should get it in. And then if you decide through the process that there are other things you want to address, we can certainly do an amendment right after or six months from that time um, if you want to address more specific issues that, have, that are not identified in the incomplete letter. I have a question, Elizabeth. Is, and I know I've been sitting through meetings on it, is it a big thing, how big of a thing is it to, to make an amendment? There's more work. You know, for a small for a small amendment, um, it's just more about process and paper because you do have to hold, you know, public hearings and um, send out notices to the public that you're making an amendment and circulating it. But we see them a lot from other communities when they're very small amendments. You know, they send it out with a, a sheet that's attached. Just check the box if you have comments. And so it does go very quickly. It's it's timely because it's policy decision. So it's more work on the Planning Commission Council's part. 
but there's not a lot of writing part because the big sections of the comp plan we're doing now, you generally don't make a lot of, you don't make a lot of amendments in the park section and unless you're doing some, a parks project because there's five components to this comp plan. Really a lot of the, the amendments come in the land use section. So when you're only uh, amending a very small section in land use, it goes very quickly, especially with the other jurisdictional review. Thank you. Elizabeth, with the um, response back to the Met Council, um, do we have to recirculate that then to the other municipalities for review, or what's the process for responding to their concerns? We do not. Um, they consider they consider it incomplete because they felt that we didn't address the laundry list of issues in that letter, but they don't feel that we have to go back through the, the process. Um, I think from what Hyla indicated is if we deviated from the letter, um, then she said, yes, we would have to go through that process, which is why she recommended that if there are changes that we get through this process, complete this one, because it's, it's the entire 2040 comprehensive plan that we're submitting, um, and then just take certain chunks that you would like to address on a much smaller basis. Thank you. Anyone else? Then, if not, uh, number 16, we have a closed meeting. Mr. Mayor, I think you want a motion to set that. Um, oh, workshop. set the date for the yep. workshop. <coughs> Anyone want to move to set the date of April 3rd for the workshop from 4 to 6 p.m.? So moved. And a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, now we're down, finally we're down here. Uh, we'll have a closed meeting discussion in a minute. Or do we have to adjourn first or we adjourn after? Yeah, you, you make the announcement and then you adjourn, clear okay. the chambers and then you go to closed session. So we'll have a closed meeting discussion on the northeast east quad land, which we just saw all that on. And so I need a motion to adjourn and then we will uh, you're not adjourning the meeting, you're closing it. Oh, just closing it? Yep. So, yeah. Do I need a motion? Yes. Motion to close the meeting. Motion to close the meeting. And the second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming out on a cold night again. It's only 8.30. Where's my calendar? Can I get a